Hello, this is Tim Martindale, and welcome to part five of my series on how to better understand respiratory therapy for healthcare workers and nurses specifically. I want to talk today about assessment of hypoxia and what are the best ways to do that. So let's say that you go in and do your morning assessment or your evening assessment on the patient and you know they're alert and you've done their vital signs and the vital signs seem to be okay and um, they're asking you questions about procedures that might be happening today or the medications that you're, that you're delivering and, and then you leave. But then later on, you come back into the room and now you notice that the patient is really anxious. They're kind of squirming around in the bed and they're picking at things. Um, and you start to talk to them and you're not getting good answers to the questions that you're asking. You know, during, during a neural assessment we'll ask, do you know who the president is? Do you know what your birth date is? What is your wife's name? All those types of questions. And what we're doing is we're assessing for level of consciousness. And that is the number one thing that you should be assessing and potentially thinking about whether or not they have hypoxia. What we know is that as a respiratory therapist, we were taught a rule, and the rule is O2 anxious, CO2 somnolence. And what that means is that if a patient's oxygen level drops, they will become more anxious. If their CO2 level rises, they'll be calm and they just want to go to sleep. That's an important hallmark feature that you have to think about when you're doing your assessment. So the first thing that I look at is I want to know what their level of consciousness is. As I'm assessing the patient, I'm going to be talking to them, asking them questions, trying to get an idea as to whether that level of consciousness could be diminished because maybe another process happening, but maybe not hypoxia. But if I'm assessing for hypoxia, I start with level of consciousness. The next thing I want to look at is respiratory rate. You know, most people are going to be breathing somewhere between 12 and 16 breaths per minute. Um, if I notice that their respiratory rate has increased and they're breathing 24, 26, 30 times per minute, that is a clinically important thing to recognize because as, as oxygen levels are dropping, the body's normal compensatory response to that is to increase respiratory rate and increase heart rate. So their level of consciousness has dropped, their respiratory rate has increased, the heart rate has increased. Increased respiratory rate is called tachypnea, increased heart rate is called, is called tachycardia. Those features are very important that you have to recognize. And then of course we have our O2 saturation. But I want to talk a little bit about O2 saturation. Normal is considered to be 98 to 100 um, percent. As you get older, you know, we can accept 92, 94, 95 percent. Um, but let's talk about what you're actually reading with an O2 saturation by pulse oximeter. And the best way to, to describe this is I'm going to tell you a story. I was working as a night shift supervisor in a hospital, and a patient came into the, into the uh, ER and they were triaged, and it was an elderly gentleman uh, with an elderly woman. It was his wife who brought him into the hospital. And, and this is what was noticed by, by the triage nurse. First of all, he was confused. So his level of consciousness was diminished. He was disoriented. He couldn't answer basic questions. His respiratory rate was very high. He was breathing greater than 30 times per minute. That's acute tachypnea. His heart rate was very tachycardic. It was somewhere around 120 beats per minute. Blood pressure was low. I think it was about 100 systolic. We'll say over 40. His O2 saturation, 100%. Okay, so let's look at this patient. He was brought into the ER to the trauma room, and 
the ER doctor that paged me wanted me to draw an arterial blood gas because he knew there was also a respiratory therapist besides a registered nurse. The normal place that we would puncture would be the radial artery. That's on the thumb side. Uh, it was very weak and thready, you know, very high heart rate, very low blood pressure. So I moved to the second option, which is the brachial artery. Same thing. I could feel it, but I'm not going to puncture somebody unless I have a very definitive spot to stick the needle in so I hit the artery. And he just said, just, Tim, just go ahead and go down to the femoral artery. So I went to the femoral artery. I could feel that much better. So I had my blood gas apparatus all set up, and um, I palpated the pulse, and I punctured. The blood gas syringe is starting to fill up, and I almost pulled the syringe out because I didn't think it was in the right place. And the ER doctor says, no, no, just let it fill and go ahead and analyze that. So I let it fill and um, took it down to the blood gas analyzer in the respiratory therapy department, and I ran the blood gas. Uh, pH was um, very acidic. Uh, PCO2 was elevated. Not too bad, though. Um, the PO2, which is normally 80 to 100, was reading 700. That I had never seen before. Um, O2 sat was 100%. And then I ran it through our co-oximeter, and I got the hemoglobin. The hemoglobin was 2.4 grams per deciliter. The patient died about an hour later from acute tissue hypoxia and acute lactic acidosis. So this is what I need you to understand. O2 saturation by itself is not enough information. And I remember the very first O2 sat pulse oximeter that I'd ever seen. Um, it was back when I was in respiratory school. It was the summer of 1981. And during that rotation, we did our anesthesia rotation, which meant we could go down to the OR, and with an anesthesiologist, they would watch our technique in intubating a patient. That's how we learned how to intubate. Very controlled atmosphere. So I intubated the patient, <clears throat> we secured the endotracheal tube, and I sat down next to the anesthesiologist, and we were talking, and I looked over his shoulder, and there was a device that was about this long, by about that wide, about that thick, weighed probably 25, 30 pounds, and it, it gave one number. It was O2 saturation. And I thought I had died and gone to heaven, because instead of doing an arterial puncture, if I wanted to measure oxygenation status, all he had to do was hook up a probe to the earlobe and he gave a continuous readout of what that patient's O2 saturation is. That was one of the first devices. Now, anesthesia, they always have the, the, most, the, the coolest toys to play with. That was one of them. Nowadays, O2 saturation can be measured by a pulse oximeter that is small enough to fit on your finger. It's a great device. Um, so when you're doing your vital signs on a patient, you can measure what the O2 saturation is. But let's look at this patient again. If you did not know level of consciousness, respiratory rate, heart rate or blood pressure, or hemoglobin, you just measured the O2 saturation, he looks fine, 100%. But he died because he was acutely anemic. It is very easy for the body to saturate 2.4 grams of hemoglobin. His hemoglobin should have been 17. Female should be, you know, 15. There's a range there. But he died because of this right there. And if you didn't look at anything else in your assessment uh, picture, if you just looked at that, you would think the patient was good and the patient died. I'm not saying don't measure O2 saturation. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is if you're going to measure O2 saturation, there's another piece of the equation that you have to understand, and that is what is the patient's blood count? What is his hemoglobin level? It's like, if I told you the patient's cardiac output is five, that sounds good, but what if the heart rate was 140 and the blood pressure was very, very low? You have to factor in all, all of the equation to get a good understanding an assessment of what is happening with that patient. If you measure O2 saturation, and I know you will, just in the back of your mind think about 
When was the last time we did a CBC on this patient? When was the last time we did an H and H? I wonder what the hemoglobin level is. That's my story, and that's what I have to say to you. And thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions, don't forget to put comments and questions on my YouTube videos, and I'll be sure to answer them. Thank you.